This video is in reply to the video posted by Current Topper. Current Topper uh, on 6th April 2020. At 21.58, at time position 21.58, uh, Topper, Current Topper does the Chutiapa. Okay, before that only he starts doing Chutiapa. Huh? I just explained what Chutiapa did in his uh, interview with uh, of that old man. Hi Chaman. Chaman means Chaman. Chaman Mr. Thapar. Thapar Chaman. Hmm? Thapar Chaman. Thapar. Karan Thapar. Karan Thapar. I saw your video yesterday. You posted one video in which you are interviewing uh, one uh, old man who got Corona virus and was treated at Safdar Jang Hospital. He got, you know, cured, it seems, that is what he is telling, but he is under home quarantine for another 15 days. And in the meantime, you are putting bot, die and, uh, <laughs> and you are, you know, interviewing this fellow on uh, this one, on chat. You are not interviewing him on uh, this one, on, you know, uh, live like you did for that uh, Narendra Modi show. Narendra Modi, you did, you know, long time back. That like that you are not done. You have done something like, you know, uh, <coughs> video on call, so video call uh, interview. By the end of the interview, what you have done, by the end of the interview, what you have done is chaman, chaman, uh, chaman type thing you have done. What chaman type thing you have done is, you are asking the age of the, that fellow, and he is telling uh, 59 years. 9 years he is telling and you are trying to make it a motivational video wherein people are you know unnecessarily getting scared most of the people are you know, having only 80 percent of symptoms etc etc do you even know what is uh, immunology what is uh, immunity have you covered that have you studied about that i don't think you have studied or studied, studied about that you might have studied some journalism that's all you might have gone to london uk whatever but still you don't have that much a girl uh, you know uh, to you know that you are putting such a thing uh, you are trying to motivate people to come out of the house is it by telling that okay even older people won't get you know will might get cured uh, of this corona disease and there is no people are simply getting scared is that what you want to tell that is what you wanted to tell yeah, that is a very wrong thing what you have done what you have done is a very wrong thing you should not do like that the immunity of a person depends on a lot of things a lot of things a lot of things one thing is about how the person has been brought up what kind of you know food he had when he was growing up all those things count and the uh, living circumstances for example a foreigner or a, or a european or a american who is born and brought up there in that country would have lesser immunity uh, regarding diseases they will have lesser immunity regarding any disease uh, they come to so you know third world country like india in india we are not in country and we are used to all this dirt and uh, virus and so much smoke is there and automatically a person in india would have developed so much you know resistance but the same cannot be told about each and every person in India or so. The immunity of a person depends on a lot of other factors. If a person is suffering from any kind of other disease or taking any steroids or is on, you know, is having any autoimmune disorder, for that, if they are taking any medication, the immunity of a person will be very low. And the chance of they, you know, getting this, in, in this infection or any other infection will be high, it will be more than. Uh, 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 compared to a normal person. All these things you have not discussed. Simply you are trying to motivate people by the end of your you know, stupid show. Where, you know, I don't know, if at all you are so much you know, confident, you, are, you might be of the same age, you know, 60 years maybe. Why didn't you go you know, with your mic and danda you know, to his house? Why didn't you go? Simply you no, know, don't mislead people, man. Whether a person will catch, you know, corona disease or not, whether whether a person who has caught it uh, might, you know, who might you know, succumb to the disease or get cured of the disease or the 
disease might take, uh, you know there is a, a chance of relapse or remission of the disease whatever you know uh, they are showing on tv okay regarding this corona uh, virus all these things are yet to be confirmed they are not in a pakka information so please don't simply you know uh, you know uh, pass bullshit information like this and to i don't know what kind of trp anyway you all those shows to, you know your shows and all they don't have you know they don't come on tv anymore okay with a youtube channel also you won't do your you know won't leave you know doing your musty is it don't do all this man don't do all this uh, concentrate on all that old <laughs> video which you left incomplete do complete that one Take a little trip with me I'm gonna take you home Take a little history Take a little history Down this plane of memory Down the plane down the plane So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become Yeah yeah Cuz little that we know the good times come and go but the bad still's yet to come Special interview for the wire. Today we have a very special guest, someone who got coronavirus, spent up to 19 days in two different hospitals, Ramban Hall, Loy, and Safdarjah Hospital, in complete and total self-isolation, was treated, was released two days ago, and is willing to share with us the entire experience he's been through. He is the director of the Institute of Economic Growth in India, as well as a professor of economics at the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. Professor Ajit Mishra. Professor Mishra, let's start at the very beginning, if I may call it a story. When did you first begin to suspect you had coronavirus, and what did you do? Okay, well, firstly, thank you for giving me the chance to share my story, and it's important because it, it, it's a positive one. It, it's a you know good ending, and then uh, in the impact there are some useful lessons from my. Uh, experience with this virus and hospitalization now in response to your uh, the question about you know when did i start suspecting that i have something like this uh, was uh, on um, the night of the 15th 15th of march uh, that is i returned from uk on that particular evening uh, by one of the air india flights i came around reached at on 10 it was all clear till then in fact the airport uh, you know the temperature check and all that went on so fine but in the night i had a pretty high temperature and that got the alarm bells ringing because you know once you have something like this i started thinking oh i had a bit of a cough in fairfield i had a bit of you know fatigue or tiredness in bath and all those things i put uh, two and two together and then the next morning after breakfast i my secretary called up ramon loya and we got an ambulance and i just went straight to uh, rml for uh, testing because uh, that was the safest thing to do firstly as a director you know i'll have so many meetings and will meet so many people so it's very easy to spread and my elderly parents are here staying with me so that's the biggest stress so i'm probably What yeah. happened when you arrived at RML? You said they sent an ambulance to take you. Yeah. What happened when you arrived there? Well, I must say it was pretty scary because uh, the testing center, you know, that is uh, was an ideal because you know we had about it was very crowded about 80 90 uh, you know maybe even close to 100 people there waiting to be tested. It we were all waiting in a small corridor. and i must say you know fair amount of intermingling going on which now when you think you know people asking each other for pen for paper and things like this so not the ideal environment for uh, corona testing i must say uh, i had my turn after a couple of hours and then uh, because my travel history to uk and because of the fact that i had a very high temperature uh, they decided to admit me in rml uh, in the isolation ward Now tell us about the RML isolation ward. Can you describe it? Can you tell us what it was like? What the treatment was like? 
Well, I mean, there isn't much of a treatment uh, here because, you know, once you're admit, they just, you know, treat your symptoms in terms of, you know, if you have a temperature, they will give you paracetamol or... And I think Tamiflu is the standard uh, drug which uh, you are given once you are in the hospital. Now, this ward is uh, not isolation room, but this is an isolation ward. So each room or each, if you like, the big uh, room has about uh, six beds. Uh, they are meant to be, you know, kept one meter apart with screen uh, partition and things like this. Uh, wasn't always the case because I had to request for a screen. You know, first two nights I spent without, you know, being screened off. And I mean, it's it's my my feeling is that it's not meant for a four or five day stay. It's meant for an overnight stay, maybe when you are waiting for your result to come out. Was the condition sanitary? Was the toilets clean? I uh, don't think so, because, uh, I mean, there is no washroom facility, well, there is no shower facility for the men section. It was a common, uh, you know, uh, toilet and washroom. Uh, yes, you, they had the sanitizers and all those kind of things in place, uh, but, you know, for example, for five days, uh, four days, I didn't have a shower. I didn't have any wash because there was no space for it. So those aspects could have been made better in RML, I thought. What were the doctors and nurses like at Ramal Holloya? They were very helpful, very friendly, very reassuring, I must say, uh, because there were a couple of young kids also, you know, admitted uh, in fact in my room. They were obviously worried, anxious, but I was I saw the doctors uh, being very reassuring and you know, giving statistics like most people turn out negative, don't worry, and things like this. No, so, so I have no complaints on that. They were very very helpful. Uh, what was the food like? <laughs> uh, food, uh, well, they, they, they kind of, uh, my food was, uh, uh, I mean, initially I, I, I didn't notice, uh, but it's okay, I guess, it's, it, given the circumstances, uh, it's pretty reasonable. How many people were there with you in this isolation ward, as you described it? Uh, the ward, I cannot say, my room, let's say, I can say... Uh, when I got in on the night of or the afternoon of 16, there were about uh, three beds were occupied and we were empty. Uh, next morning there were more. So at the, the night I left, we had about five people. Only one bed was on a bed. Now I believe after three or four days at Raman or Lawyer, you were moved to Saftajang. Why were you moved? And then I talked to you about Saftajang after that. Yeah. Okay, so the, I guess the normal practice, so I tested positive or my results came on 19th uh, the, or based on the sample which was taken on the 16th. So on 19th, uh, around, you know, shortly after 11, 11.30, they informed me that uh, I've tested positive and that's when they moved me to uh, Saptachan Hospital. Uh, were you in a room on your own in Saptachan? Were you once again in a ward? What were the conditions in which you were kept? Okay, something I was on the fourth floor, so I don't know about the policy on other floors. Uh, but it's a completely isolation room, so I, I was in a room by myself. Uh, fairly biggest room, so you can walk about in, in the room, you know, if you like, you can do your step running and step jogging also, you know, those kind of things. So it's, it's a big room uh, with the attached bath, uh, I mean, bath meaning shower and, 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 and toilet. And I don't know, other floors might have uh, sharing boards, but uh, yeah, fourth floor was completely isolation rooms with a window, uh, which we were allowed to open uh, to get some fresh air. How long were you at Saftajan Hospital? Well, I was there on the 19th night, and I was discharged on 4th. So that's about 15 days. Uh, that's, quite, that's quite a long stay. When did your fever abate? Well, I had two spikes. So, uh, 15th night was my you know, big fever. And then I would get fever on and off, but never so high. And during Sabdarjan, so maybe around 21st, 22nd, I had, uh, you know, my fever. I didn't have any more fever. Uh, yeah. Uh, what other symptoms other than fever did you show? Did you have breathing problems? Did you have a dry cough? I had a dry cough. 
In fact, now that I think of it, my dry cough was pretty old because when I moved from uh, my home to Heathrow in the in, in a in a late early morning National Express coach, I was having dry cough. But that I normally put it down to National Express. Uh, these coaches they make it very hot, you know, very warm. So I tend to cough in that, uh, you know, the dry cough because it makes me feel dry. But that could have been part of this. So I had dry cough for quite some time, uh, even when the temperature went up. But I didn't have other symptoms like diarrhea or uh, chest pain or you know, breathing difficulties. Uh, there were some days when there was a bit of chest tightness, but uh, nothing that uh, worried them. Now, as you said, the fever abated and disappeared on the 21st, which is two days after you reached Safkaja Hospital. When did the other symptoms, like the dry cough, disappear? Uh, dry cough also around the same time, uh, maybe maybe two or three days more. Uh, but then I continued to have a kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's not a dry cough or it's not a sore throat, but it's a lumpiness in the throat. You always feel that there is something. And when did that feeling stop? That feeling stopped around 26th, 27th. So uh, all symptoms from dry cough and fever through to the lumpiness in the throat were finished and over with by the 26th, 27th. Yet you continued in hospital till the 4th of April. Why were you made to stay those extra nearly 10 days? Well, you see, the, the, the policy or the protocol here is that, you know, they will wait, uh, you know, for you to have, you know, got rid of all the symptoms and then they will do two more tests or they will retest you, if you like, take two more samples. Uh, and so in my case, in fact, uh, 28th, I think, uh, they took the second uh, sample or the first retest sample and they repeated. So in my case, uh, it was pretty early by their standard, actually. So I was admitted on 19th and on 28th, uh, the first retest sample was taken. I think that the, the problem is uh, because first they have to do a two negative test, I mean, two, two negative results they have to get before they can discharge you. Uh, the, the problem which is not within Sabdarshan's control, I think, is, is because the tests are taking so much time. So it was the delay in the test results coming in that meant yeah. you were there till the 4th of April? Yeah. Yeah. So they got the second test result on 3rd of April and they discharged me immediately. Now you told us already that at Sabdarshan you had a room to yourself, which was a fairly biggish room. You had a toilet and a bathroom and the shower worked, so you were able to shower. You also could do minimal exercise in the room because it was big enough. What was the general treatment you received from the doctors and nurses like? Uh, sometimes I must say it is excellent. Uh, it is very good. Uh, I mean, I knew the nodal officer, uh, Dr. Gupta. He, he came on the first day, explained me the whole situation very clearly uh, about you know what the strategy will be and things like this. Uh, we have excellent nursing care in Sabdarshan because the nurses would come visit you four times a day to check your temperature, blood pressure and, you know, uh, blood uh, oxygen. And it used to be cleaned twice a day. Maybe on some days uh, it will be cleaned once, but it was it, it was kept very clean and high as a tank. And so, what was the food at Sabdarshan like? I must tell you, Karan, I started enjoying the food after a while. Uh, I used to play a game with my wife, so I would take a picture of, you know, whatever the food comes. And then after I finish eating, I'll send a picture saying that, look, I finished everything. And in fact, doctors were also always asking me whether I, my appetite is still there. Uh, food is pretty decent and I was put on a diabetic meal, so they were making sure that, you know, there is, uh, I would receive any white rice, I will always have chapatis and uh, in smaller quantities. Uh, in, in all this lockdown and things, you know, they managed to give us papaya on some of the days. So, you know, you would get a nice glass of milk, uh, boiled egg, papaya. Uh, so, yeah, so the food was uh, uh, pretty good given the hospital. Is it essentially vegetarian or is there a non-vegetarian option if one wants? Uh, the non-vegetarian option is essentially egg. Egg, okay. No meat at all. No meat or chicken. No. Now, you've been released from hospital on the 4th. 
Are you under home quarantine at the moment? And if so, for how long? Uh, I'm under home quarantine till the uh, 15th of April. So, so it's, I guess it's two weeks from the sample was taken or whatever. You know, I'll have to check my discharge note. Yeah. You said that your elderly parents are with you in Delhi. During home quarantine, can you meet them or do you have to be in separate rooms all the time? I'm in my room, I'm in my bed and study my bathroom on one side, so that's it. It's a nicely constructed house, so it's separate. Uh, but I do talk to them. I mean, I put a mask and I keep my one meter distance from them. And I do go out to the garden also when there is nobody in the garden. But essentially, you have to keep your distance from your parents. Yes, that's right. My last question for this part. Looking back on the time you spent in hospital, how do you evaluate the sort of care you got and the ability of the Indian healthcare system to respond to this crisis? Okay, the first one, the care at Sabdarjang is uh, extremely good, care and facilities both. Now, so there we might may have an issue whether in you know, all other places where COVID patients are being treated, whether we can provide similar levels of care or not. So I might have been lucky, uh, not just in being Sabdarjang, but also being at a time when there is no big rush. Uh, when things will get crowded, we don't know how uh, things will be. So that's the first one. And the second one, you know, given that you know, the, the tests are taking so much time, because we are always talking about tests being done on you know, people who don't know whether they are positive or negative, but equally important is these negative results waiting. Because if there is a pressure on beds, you cannot keep somebody for almost a week to discharge just because the reports are coming in late. So we have to do something about speedier testing. I'm going to take a break at that point. Sorry, was I interrupting you? You were about to say something. Oh, no, no, that, that's I right. I'll take a break at that point. When I come back, I want okay. to talk to you about the personal trauma, the tension that you must have suffered. Because as you said, you are alone in Delhi, but your wife and children are in Bath. This must have been traumatic for you as well as for them. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that because that also is something that deeply concerns people who are worried that if something happens like this to them, how will they respond personally? But first, a message from our sponsor, Glenn Lift. Take a little trip with me, I'm going to take you home. Take a little history. Take a little, take a little. Down this plane of memory. So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become, yeah, yeah. Cause little that we know, the good times come and go, but the bad still's yet to come. Welcome back to a special interview for The Wire. My guest is a very special person who has spent, I believe, 19 days in Ramanur Doya in Saftarjan Hospital suffering from coronavirus. He is the director of the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi as well as a professor of economics at the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. In part one, he told us in great detail about the treatment and his experience of both Ramanur Doya and Saftarjan Hospital and as well as his opinions of the way in which the Indian healthcare system is responding to this crisis. But now, I want to ask him, what was it like to be alone, cut off from your family, to your wife and children in another country, in India, in hospital, suffering from what many believe could be a terrible life-threatening disease? What was that like, Professor Nishra? Well, in my case, uh Given that the, the, the physicality, the physical aspects of the disease wasn't so severe in the sense uh, I, did, I did require critical care at any stage. Uh, my main problem was, uh, was keeping the mental balance, uh, the, the, the psychological impact on myself and my, my family. So that was the, you know, I would say the, the bigger factor. And also, you know, since you have asked me, I want to use this opportunity to say that you know, the, we have created so much information about the horrible things which the virus can do that that has gone into everybody's head. There is a tendency that, you know, if you catch the virus, you're going to drop dead immediately. Okay. So we have, you know, created this uh, panic state. So in my own experience, every night, you know, when I would go to sleep, I would start imagining that, oh, tonight will be the night that I'm going to get all this chest pain and all those horrible things will happen to me. Yeah. And in fact, it was so bad that I asked the doctor, 
you know, how come I'm not getting any of those symptoms? And that's when, you know, I knew it, but he also reconfirmed that in most of the cases, you know, in 80% of the cases, the symptoms continue to be mild. Okay. So it, it's the psychology, it's, it's the mental thing, which is this thing. Uh, I thought, I mean, I managed it pretty well in the hospital. I kept uh, a diary. I would write every day for a couple of hours and things like this. Uh, there will be ups and downs. Uh, but, you know, and especially closer to the retesting part, you know, the, the tension builds up a bit because you are waiting to, you know, get the negative result and get discharged. So you lived for those 19 days with a fair amount of fear and apprehension in your mind. Yeah. Which is what I would tell everybody that, you know, no, we should not do that. We should not have that kind of excessive fear and apprehension. Of course, we should be fearful. Of course, we should be careful. Uh, but no, that, that's probably going to do more damage. You said, I mean, I, you said that every night before you'd go to sleep, you would ask yourself, am I going to have those horrible things, the heart conditioning? Was it difficult to sleep at night? Uh, initially, yes, uh, but you know, slowly, slowly, I got used to it. Uh, 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 first few nights were very difficult uh, to sleep because precisely of this apprehension. Um, you know, slightest you know change in the pain in the chest, you start thinking, oh, is, is it uh, this? Am I going to you know I need some extra support? Uh, but you know, once the first week was over, and my doctor informed me that if anything, I must have picked up the infection before 15th of uh, March. So you know, around 22nd, 21st, uh, I was pretty relaxed that you know, uh, maybe the worst days are over. But during those terrible days, when you would often be unable to sleep at night, fearing that terrible things would happen, did you begin to come to terms, if one ever can? with the fear of death, because in a very real sense, that's what the newspaper and TV reports suggest you must have faced every night. Uh, somehow, but the fear of death wasn't uh, this thing, because, you know, it's also partly my experience in life with, you know, I have been through, I've been through a, uh, what should I say, you know, cardiac ward, I've stayed there, I've had a geoplasty, so I've been through, you know, hospitals and I have some experience. So that wasn't there and I was quite determined even from the first night that you know it doesn't matter how many days it's going to take, I'm going to come out of this room. Uh, yeah. So, so. How, how old are you Professor Mishra and has this experience in hospital changed you? Do you feel stronger for it? Do you feel you know yourself better as a result? Uh, I think I do. I think I do and uh, I'm pretty happy with myself. Uh, uh, that you know, I managed uh, you know whatever those 19 days uh, fairly well, uh, you know, in, in different conditions. And uh, my wife also thinks that uh, I did a pretty good job. How old are you? Can I ask? I, I'm 58 years old. 58. Uh, uh, yeah. Tell us about your wife and children, because all the while when you were in India in hospital, yes. they were cut off from you. And they were in another country altogether. That's what right. did he go through? Well, I mean, my, I have a son who is 16 year old, you know, 16 and a half, and my wife, so they they live in Bath. Uh, I think my wife also had uh, the viral infection, this coronavirus, because we developed symptoms roughly at the same time, although uh, she was uh, self isolating at home and she recovered pretty quickly. Uh, but you know, after the recovery, her main worry was uh, me in a, in, a, in a hospital, and given my cardiac conditions and all that, obviously I'm considered a high risk patient. So even in UK, I received letters uh, being one of the vulnerable section and asking me not to step out. So that was her main worry. But uh, in some sense, the the time gap helps because even in the middle of the night, if I can't sleep, I can always call and we can do you know uh, skyping or we can do WhatsApp uh, chatting. Uh, so we were uh, constantly in touch. What about uh, your elderly parents who were alone in your home in Delhi, cut off from you? They must have been extremely anxious and worried. Uh, my mother is. My mother was extremely worried. Uh, and so also my father, but uh, 
but and I was also worried, you know, at some point uh, about what's going to happen. But we, you know, the IG, I must say, IG administration, the the, the officiating director after me, we made excellent arrangements for them. So because my parents were supposed to also self isolate because you know I stayed for four hours or four five hours in the house with them, and my cook who came and served me breakfast, so she was also supposed to self isolate. So we had a system where. Uh, the cook and our husband and my parents, they all lived in my house here uh, in, in self-isolation. So they had support. So because they were all meant to self-isolate, they could actually be in contact with each other. They yes. wouldn't endanger each other. That's right. Which suggests that if you have to have it, it's better that other people have it along with you so that you can maintain some sort of existence in self-isolation with people similarly affected. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know it's, it's scientifically I, I have doubts about this policy because what if one of the person has you know, picked up the virus? So by doing this kind of group self-isolation, uh, you know, maybe it, it's not the right thing to do. So they were asked to be careful, you know, and, and maintain a safe distance. But yes, they had company and, and it saved my parents actually because they're completely dependent. Now, in roughly eight days' time, you will be free to walk out of your front door, no more home isolation, you will have recovered from coronavirus. What are the first few things you want to do? Well, I haven't been to my office for a while, so I'll <laughs> go to my office to get some of my files. And I've been just sitting uh, idle at, you know, in hospital or home. So I'll probably go to the gym to some, you know, start uh, getting back into some of my daily exercises. I go for a walk. You know, within the campus that is, because you know we don't know what's going to happen to the lockdown, so uh, I may not still step out of the building. So these are the three things. And when do you think you'll be able to meet your wife and son? Because they remain in bus a long way away. Uh, it's going to take a while. I was supposed to go there in during May. Uh, that was the plan, uh, but it doesn't look feasible. Uh, and also international travel is going to be pretty difficult now. You know, countries will have different uh, rules of quarantine and things like this. Uh, it's possible that you know, they might come in July or I might go, but we're not even thinking about you know, when that's going to be. So we're taking uh, every day as it comes. Is that one of the lessons you've learned? Don't look and think too far ahead. Take it every day, every week, one at a time. Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to share you with a little story uh, precisely on this point. A few years back, you know, along with my wife and uh, child, we, we did a small uh, climbing in Wales. It's called Kedir Idri. It's a small mountain. So you have to climb lots of steps. I won't tell you how many. It's just hundreds. So after climbing a bit, You know, other people are coming down the steps. And I asked them, you know, how many more to go? And the lady smiled at me, said, don't even ask, just take 10 at a time. And I knew why she said that, because if she had said that there are about 2,000 more steps, I would have simply said, let's go back. Uh, so yes, that's what I was doing basically. Take every day as it comes, so every week, you know, once things get better, maybe we'll talk in terms of week rather than days. But that's what our strategy is now. My last question, will this have changed the way you lead your life, the way you think about things in the future? Uh, no, in terms of activities, you know, I remember I went to UK, I thought, you know, did I do the right thing? But it was meant to be a lecture, it was work related, so I had to go. So yes, I'll still, you know, do my international travel, that's not going to change. Uh, I'll probably be more positive about things, so that's something which has, you know, added to my, uh, you know, the character. And uh, uh, rest all is, you know, I think... It's all there, so. Professor Mishra, I'm deeply grateful for the very open, full way you have shared with us, not just what you've been through, but also what it's done to you 
your wife and son and your parents. Thank you very much for speaking so fully because you'll have a large audience who will actually want to learn from what you said and will take a lot of assurance in particular from what you said about Satyajak Hospital. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.